this is uh, This is Joe Cole. This is Ruben Off the Cheek, and you're listening to the London, London, London is Blue, Blue podcast. podcast. All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London is Blue podcast. As always, your host, Brandon, joined by my host, Nick and Joe. That's right. We're just going to roll tweeds in. He's no longer special. He's just one Third of Third choice the host. Third choice Third host. host. Sorry, Nick. Salt in the wounds. Uh, but hey, look, we are coming at you with the Aston Villa match review from the Carabao or League Cup, depending on how far back you want to go with your traditional uh, views and uh, it was a good one. Chelsea came out on top, although it was a bit labored. Uh, we're recording fairly recent uh, to the final whistle, so this should be a little bit more raw and loose. But I think the people are looking forward to that, Joe. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, probably I would say that this doesn't equate in terms of emotions, but I always think the uh, the Champions League episode we did very soon after the final whistle. That's kind of the blueprint for these episodes: quick raw reactions. Um, yeah, not being super, super duper analytical, but uh, yeah, still, still same high quality stuff that we usually do. The energy, the energy is real. It is the you know unfiltered version of one is blue. Yeah, it may only be the early stages of the tournament, but uh, it still provided some excitement to say the least. So uh, we're going to be talking about La Cabum on display today. We'll be talking about Kepa coming good, continuing his good run of form, and then more questions and answers at the end. And I'll make sure to include a rant. But before we do that, Dan, the patent three-word match review. Look, uh, just like Chelsea at the death, these came in with some fire on them, some hot sauce. We had John with the sorry Matt Law again in the LIBP Matt Law Derby. It Have is, we checked uh, on him? Can, can we check his Twitter account? Is he okay? I'm, I'm sure he's marked himself as safe uh, on Facebook, so I think we're good. Uh, Tana with the acronym one, which is RLC CDM LFG. <laughs> uh, Mount with the Reese and Desist, which is quite special. Kate with the experiencing technical difficulties with a screenshot of the ESPN Plus stream during its downtime. We had Hendrick 007 with the super fucking Keppa. We had Glasgow Chelsea with the guys. Remember Ruben? Chelsea Vision with the Ruben Tata, like Remen Tata, with uh, hoping that no one has used that one yet. Jeff Duck's daddy with the Ruben Loftus Peaks. And then our friend Ali Glanville had submitted one with just Reese motherfucking James in <laughs> the DMs. That was quite wonderful as well. But there's a lot of a lot of positive energy, a lot of emotion. Like this was the type of match for it. So, I mean, Joe, where did you land on your three word match review? I went for Ruben Loftus Remen Tata. A little bit of a FT in there at the end, but uh, yeah, I think people will know me as a, a very uh, ardent and long-term Loftus Cheek uh, fan from from the academy days, and it's just nice to see him having an impact on the game, enjoying his football, and I think he was superb tonight. So yeah, RLR. Yeah, uh, definite claim to fame for us having photos with the big man and having sat down to interview him as well. That was a probably a career highlight for quite a few of us on the pod. I put let them struggle. All right. So many people complaining, hook him at halftime, make changes this and that these players needed minutes to work through their problems. And we will talk about that a little bit more, but got to let them struggle. It's a part of the development process. Dan, what about you? I went with hot mic stream. Oh, my. Because (laughs) it was just amazing that the Chelsea TV crew, who typically do the fist stand audio as well, were the audio stream for accommodating the uh or accompanying rather the espn plus video feed and they were just live during halftime they were live apparently during pre-match they were live during the interlude between full time and the start of the uh the penalty kicks and jason cunney among others had some very choice things to say it was quite wonderful it was really uh it really added a little uh a little extra on top. It's almost as if that's what we wanted actually from the beginning. And I kind of wish that was the standard, not the polished nonsense a little bit, but hey, whatever. Um, all right, Dan, uh, before we get into the, the line of everything, let's do some Apple podcast reviews. People hitting us up with the five star reviews. Oh my gosh, they keep on coming. They don't stop. Five star reviews on Apple Podcasts is a great way to help other people, other Chelsea supporters find the show and let them know that this is the best Chelsea podcast to listen to. We want to thank Ryan from the US, No Ads 19, Alex from Canada, LOL Base 3 from the US, Super Frankie 11 from the US, and Izzy Bella 1 from Australia, all leaving amazing 
five star reviews on Apple Podcasts. We super appreciate. If you haven't done it yet, you can just do it right now. We're listening to Brandon talk about match details. I uh, was checking Cundy's Twitter, and apparently he's saying it was Clive Walker. Uh, he's throwing everyone under the bus today, <laughs> naming names. Man. There's some, uh, there's some tread marks on Clive's back there. I love that. All right. Well, here we go. It was Aston Villa's past Wednesday, the 22nd of September in the Carabao or League Cup uh, at Stanford Bridge. It was Chelsea won, Villa won a full time straight to penalties, and it was 4 3 to the victors. Chelsea uh, lineup. Now we expected it. A lot of rotation. I think we all heard Matt Law's wishful lineup throwing in everyone from the bottom of the kitchen sink, but he actually wasn't that terribly off Dan was he he definitely picked a few of them we saw Kepa between the sticks he did predict uh, Bettinelli would make his first appearance Shocking. for Chelsea Reese James Trev Chalaba Sar and Chilwell as your defending grouping along with N'Golo Kante Ruben Loftus-Cheek and Saul and then Calum hudson Joy, Timo Werner and Hakim Ziyech and yeah it was just it was a really odd lineup but, you know, I mean, that's that's what the cup is for, to get a little rotation in, to give some people an opportunity. I mean, we saw Ross Barkley, of all people, come in. <laughs> we saw Mason Mount take the armband at halftime for N'Golo Kante. Um, and Lukaku had to come in as well. And so, uh, yeah, just a very interesting 11 and then also subs to have to use. But Villa were up for it, so credit to them. Yeah, so Silva on the bench, Lukaku came in, Bettinelli on the bench, Barkley came in, Mount came in, Kai on the bench, Xavier and Boyamba on the bench as well. Uh, but I think, Joe, there's probably a little bit of confusion. Was it a 4-3-3? Was it 3-5-2? I'm sorry, 3-4-3, kind of back and forth. I, I, I think that just shows there's a lot of fluidity with Tuchel in some of these lineups. But at the end, I, I do think it was three center backs Therefore, a lot of the lineups that were put out were just patently wrong. Yeah, the uh, the fascinating thing for me is that I think the the furthest lineup from the truth was actually the official one on the fifth stand up, which uh, did make me smile a tiny bit there. Um, I think that the game started with some sort of variation of a, of a back four, but very quickly moved into a back three. Um, I, I spoke with Yaz in, in the ground and he he sort of said from, from his sort of position, it, it looked at at uh or look to be a, a three five two kind of and I think that's kind of where we sort of saw it uh move into Ruben being obviously more of the traditional kind of lone holding player two central midfielder supporting him. I think the confusing element for most people was was Saul's positioning because I don't really know what he was what he was trying to do in the first half. And that, that's not really a, a critique of his performance, although I think we'll probably get into that just more that positionally you know, he seemed to be like a very wide central midfielder. Then he was sort of a little bit joining the attacks as almost like a forward. And I think he was the one that was confusing people in terms of the setup. Um, Kante and, and loftus Sheet were playing fairly close together. Reese James was was sort of flitting between right back and, and right centre back. But I think as the game solidified, and I think as Tuchel really uh, took control of, of what was going on, it was more of a, a 3-5-2, I would say, certainly in terms of the, the shape there. And I, I won, the one thing I'll say, and just before handing it over here, I... I really don't want to see Hakim Ziyech playing as a centre forward again. Um, you know, I, I just, it's just such a, if you're going to try and get him into the game, don't sort of use him as a Lukaku alternative and ping balls to him and expect him to, to be a hold up player. So um, wasn't a, I think a great use of, of him in the system, but I think for, for uh, Brandon's point, it was a lot about putting people in uncomfortable situations and actually getting the minutes and getting them to to figure things out and move through the the gears and and you know problem solve on on the fly. So some top line stats: Chelsea with 18 shots, seven of them on target. To Villa's 10, who also had seven on target. So good day from them on a shot accuracy standpoint. Uh, Chelsea with a dominating 69 percent possession. Uh, we had you know almost we had over double their passes. Our accuracy was 88 percent. So at the end of the day, that's that's a good average pass accuracy. We had 11 fouls to their eight. We picked up two cautions to their one. Uh, we had the single offsides, and we had 10 corners to their two. So a lot of practice for our corner kick takers. And we saw some good ones too, uh, even without Alonzo being out there for the in-swingers. So um, look, no XG on this one, no end pet shithouse moment of the match. So we're just going to hit the ad break so that way we can well, fly. Can we, can we talk about what was the, like, because we really didn't have one, but I'm going to say the Buendia falling down like like a Ooh, child yeah. in yep. response to Reese James touching his chest, 
but then he grabbed his jaw and then fell to the ground. Well, they're connected. That was so. Look, it's it, it look. It's not <laughs> us doing the shit housing, so it's hard to praise it. But that is some top level shit housing when you know there's no var going on. You're far enough away from the official that you're probably not going to run an, an an issue. And Reese generally, I would say, has a reputation of being a big body and being able to force himself, you know, uh, to exert his will on the pitch. And so mm-hmm. credit to Bendia for being a smart player. Uh, we didn't like it. We hate it. Smart? But smart player. I mean, it was a smart move. Was it? They, wow. For mm. By him? Sure. I don't love it. It's not a Chelsea thing. I don't love it. But, you Are know, you recognized game the shenanigans? at some point. Like you, you, like you had that pre-workout, and now you're I just haven't all yet. over the place. <laughs> no, did you see Reese's reaction? By the way, I'm concerned that you are promoting bullshit faking simulation from <laughs> players. I look, if it's it was a shit house moment, I'm just gonna call it what it is. Okay, it was shit house. All right, Joe. Uh, over no, to I was you just gonna say defense of Reese. <laughs> oh, massively! Yeah, did, did you did yeah, you see his reaction? I'm, I'm defending Reese. Dan, like, you I had mean, your moment. All right, no, Dan, clearly Team yeah. Buendia. <laughs> team, yeah, Dan Buendia Dorma for this episode. Uh, the defense has uh, an opportunity, Dan. Yeah, I, I much prefer uh, Reese's reaction, which was both to absolutely coat the referee. I don't know if you saw the aggression in his face when he was shouting at Buendia as well on the ground. Reese James, I, I, I'm going to lean into my preseason prediction here that he is the you know, the Padawan to Antonio Rudiger in the dark arts here. He is not a player when he crosses that white line that I would ever really want to irritate in any respect at all. And the aggression he was showing to pretty much Brendia and any Aston Villa player, I absolutely love that. Um, but yeah, I think Reese. I mean, his fingers brushed him on the chest. You know, he had every right to to complain. Um, and I'm, I'm curious actually if the club actually dispute that and see if they can get that yellow card rescinded because that will carry over to the league, which is mm-hmm. ridiculous considering the actual action itself. But as we know, Dan is promoting that that sort of activity. So, yeah, we're although I would say that Brandon and myself are fully behind Reese in this situation. Very true. I, I'm firmly planting myself on Team Reese and uh, am promoting the uh, the I'm, abuse I'm that the referee received. I'm going to need you to Reese received. and desist as the three word match review. Dan, uh, that would be a card for us to play on our side, uh, not yours. So objection overruled. Um, but uh, that referee also took a coding from Mason as well. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go ahead and take our ad break we'll be right back uh because we want to hit on uh the cobham display keppa and some questions over answers so thank you to sponsors for financially supporting the show we'll be right back all right before we get back huge shout out to jeff and pat who've joined the patreon bandwagon jumping in and it's timely joe that they did that because you just dropped a freaking doozy on everybody today yeah, the uh, the King's Road newsletter is fully operational and back up and running now. So uh, back, yeah, back, had a lot back, of fun back. writing us. Back, back, back. Yeah, you say newsletter. Jones, so. I mean, I feel like we should call it like a like a medical journal or <laughs> something. It's more like a series of articles that I release. But, yeah. uh, it, 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 more no. like a novella that Joe yeah, just there drops on the cash. Yeah. You know, he's like, oh, you know, I'm just going to bang out a couple uh, 10,000 words here or there on <laughs> random topics that uh, delight me as it relates to Chelsea and a myriad of other things. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's it's so much fun writing it. So uh, yeah, this this one took a bit of a deeper dive actually into some of the stuff that Dan and I was talking about on the, the Tinker Men podcast a while back with Lukaku and how, yep, there are lots of positives, but some of the, let's say, the, the lack of fluidity or maybe the, the quality that we've maybe come to associate with Tuchel's system from last season the, the sort of, I'm going to say negatives, but I'm going to call them sort of the, yeah, I mean, sort of the, I don't know, maybe negative is the right word, the negatives of having Lukaku in the side as well. So it took, took quite a bit of time to, to go through that and explain that in some detail. Um, had a look at Conor Gallagher in his start at Palace and potentially where he might fit in, in a Tuchel system. And then there are just the usual random bits and pieces, music suggestions, and a really nice look back at Mikhail Forsell's time at uh, Chelsea as well. So uh, yeah, some, some random stuff in there, but the articles I think uh, were a good read. Well, again, there's a lot of fun stuff going in on it. Uh, it's a Patreon exclusive uh, from Joe. So uh, if you subscribe, you will have access to it no matter what level. Uh, and then obviously we'll have the Man City preview dropping on Friday. So how many pods in one week, Dan? That's a, that's a big old five. That's five, five pods. pod week. Five pod week, baby. I hope uh, hope you caught them all because if not, I'm going to need you to go back and listen. All right? Them's the rules. I don't make them. Brandon Busby, the professor, <sighs> assigning some homework for yeah. you. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. And look, just press play and walk away. I, you know, I don't care. All right. I just, (laughs) I need you. I need you to maybe while you're in the shower. 
All right, get a waterproof Bluetooth speaker. I don't know, get creative. Anyways, uh, the first one we want to talk about is Lacabum on display. Am I pronouncing that right, Dan? I feel like that sounds like... Lacabum? Lacabum, La okay. Yeah, Lacabum. Reese James, Trevor Chalaba, uh, Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Mason Mount was in there for a little bit. Uh, we had we had some flair in there from the old Cobham Academy. Look, I, I I will give Joe the floor in a moment to talk about Ruben because I I think that he will maybe do a better justice uh, in terms of the his excitement. You know, he had a lot of really good tweets after the game or during the game. Um, I think Reese was fantastic. He you know, that 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 clearance that he had was immense. He stepped up and absolutely destroyed his PK. Um, and he's just, he's just a special talent. It's fun to watch him. Jeff Chalaba, just from like a, when we were under some immense pressure, he is showing that he is a ready to go solution for Thomas Tuchel on this side. Uh, not in the near future, but in the today and the present. And it actually gives me a massive sense of security looking at the fixture list that we have, looking at the fact that we've now advanced further in another competition, Club World Cup. We we talk about it ad nauseum, and it's because Chelsea are going to play a shit ton of matches between now and the end of this calendar season. And you're going to need everybody to play a part. And the more I see of Trev Chalaba, Joe, the more excited I am that, A, we kept him around this season, but, B, he's getting opportunities to really shine. And hopefully allow the club to reconsider maybe some decisions on center back recruitment look going forward. Yeah. And uh, I think the, you know, the thing today with Trev was that he was playing in that middle center back role as well. So when you look at maybe the, the long-term future of that position, most likely being Andreas Christensen, you have somebody who I think is capable of, of being the backup there. And again, if you're talking about maybe not necessarily having or carrying six center backs for the three positions, I think it's fair to say, and again, I'll, I'll you know say this. I think I've said this a few times on the pod, but Trev played a lot as a, a left-sided centre back um, when he was in France. He's actually probably more natural in that area of the pitch as well. So to see him excelling as as both the right-sided centre half, but also the middle centre back today, um, yeah, it's fantastic. And again, you're looking at is he playing well enough to make the club reconsider trying to spend 60, 70, 80 million euros on Jules Kunde? I personally think he is. Yeah, I think he had one moment where he got turned on the outside of the area, but Villa have good players and, and that happens during games. Um, I think again, largely, you know, his distribution from the back, his defensive work and the chemistry that he's got with Rhys James. Um, I think that was a, a real positive. And again, you know, you're looking at a player now who I think is being seen more and more closely linked to to the first team and somebody who isn't just an academy player coming back or is sort of uh, on the fringes of, of, of the first team. I think this is a guy that can play Premier League football for Chelsea, as you say, today and, and, and in the future. And, you know, in terms of him taking his opportunity and coming back and maybe showing the right attitude and everything that you want from a young player to take their chance, he seems to be doing it in, in every game that he's playing. So, you know, I'm looking at him as somebody who will continue to, to feature regularly this season, will get minutes probably in all the cup competitions. I would like to see him play occasionally in the Premier League, deputised for Aspie or Reese or whoever. Um, maybe he gets to the point where he's he's really competing with them for those starting spots. But fantastic, I think, in you know, largely today in in everything he did. And, you know, we we're talking about, um, you know, feeling the score with talented players, you know, costs absolutely nothing. Um, looking at a potential contract renewal on the horizon as well. So, you know, I think if everything is is positive around him, I mean, and hopefully it should uh, continue into the future. So today, my theme was, especially for these guys, was get the minutes under their belt. Um, Joe, I had actually talked with Matt Law saying like, well, if you're going to have Aspie, um, Christensen, even Reese can slot in there, and Trevor, oh, fighting for that right center back spot. If I'm in, if I'm at the training ground, and I see four people in one line and no one behind Rudiger, I'm going over there. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to take my chances. Like, I'm bet on me. I'll figure it out. And so I'm still waiting to figure out who that's going to be because it wasn't Malangsar. No offense, right. not passing judgment, just saying I would put Trevo there before Sar, where they're at right now in terms of development. Yeah. Um, but still, uh, continuing on the academy side, right? Reese James looked comfortable, right? And he looked like a leader, especially in a team full of 
you could say misfits. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean in the sense of like these pieces have not played together. No, oh, Brandon Busby is calling the players misfits. We're going to let like this yes. go right on a Twitter. Yes, I because the they have not played together. They are definitely mm. at about a 27 chemistry on FIFA right now. Like you don't believe in their innate ability to come together as players and Chemistry to get is a, a result is a proven thing. You you need it. So, but you had Reese and Angolo Conte. Everyone else really is a low minutes person on this team. And so to see Reese James be an absolute leader when Mason Mount came on in the second half, he was an absolute leader. He was literally the captain. And Angolo Conte, uh, you know who? God, I was not excited to see his name on that starting lineup. Um, those first team guys did well, but Ruben did well i think callum struggled a little bit today and you know out of those guys trevo and reese super excited ruben super excited but sadly i think callum was kind of the loser on the day amongst all the high performers dan well callum you talk about this collection of players being low minutes relative to others so callum has had two two matches played two stars 162 minutes before this uh, Saul had just had the 45 minutes. Chilwell, obviously, with a big old zero mm-hmm. um, as, as it relates. Uh, well, has sorry, anyone talked about that as a sub as a sub uh, zero starts? Um, Trev with 304 minutes, which is kind of crazy to think that he is actually higher on the list than Tiago Silva right now or Hakim Ziyech or Timo Werner. Like, that's just another kind of crazy thing to think about all comps this season. I I do think Callum continues to find himself playing, unfortunately on this wing back and having to make that come to life as the option for him to play. I would have much preferred seeing him play a little further forward and, you know, getting an opportunity to see maybe him in place of Hakim Ziyech kind of in that front line. I mean, he did, con- you know, was able to get further forward and think of the second half, Joe, but in general, I-, I don't know if we're, I don't know if Callum is right for a wing back role. And I think it is more of a trying to make something happen with Tuchel. And I don't know if we're going to, it's, it's like trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah. He's, uh, he's definitely not a wing back. I mean, I think we can, we can make that conclusion now. He's not a, a player that has those defensive instincts and, just don't think we've really seen the best of him. You know, we, we had those early appearances under Tuchel, which seemed to be more of the, the surprise of the system against opponents rather than him playing maybe particularly well. Um, I think the the sort of disappointing part, I think, as you alluded to, was that he still cannot get a look in the forward line at all. And uh, even in a, you know, a, a Carabao Cup game or whatever it's called this season, the, you know, the fact that he he can't play in, in, in these types of games in his natural position... I think says a lot. Um, the problem that he has for me now is that you've got a number of managers and coaches who have worked with him. Um, he's never really established himself under any of them. And even with Tuchel, who he seemed to start with the most sort of equity out of all of the young players, the more Tuchel has worked with him, the less he's featured. And that never really sits particularly well when I look at sort of squad composition and, and the utilization of certain players. So you're looking at somebody now who's maybe the, the third choice right wing back and, I don't know what choice he is in terms of playing in his natural position. He seems to be behind um, Werner, Mason, Havertz, uh, Ziyech, uh, probably Pulisic when he's fit, you know, when he's fit as well. And, uh, you know, coming towards uh, the the January window, I know that we're not going to talk transfers and stuff like that at the moment, but I would, you know, be looking at at possibly whether he's, you know, really featuring or impacting as much as he could be um, rather than maybe going out alone and rediscovering some confidence. The other thing I just say there is, he looks completely devoid of, of confidence at the moment in terms of his play. I mean, he's stuttering in terms of his dribbling. You know, he had yards and yards and yards of space on Ashley Young to dribble at him during this game, but he, I think he only took it maybe once or twice from memory. Um, that isn't the player that I remember seeing as a an academy player. And I'm not sure really if he has physical limitations now after that injury that he suffered. They don't seem to be there. It seems to be a, a confidence and something that's seeping into his, his technical game as well. So... I'm curious sort of long-term what, what the solution is for Callum, because if you cannot get into a Carabao Cup team, um, you know, playing in as part of a forward line or playing off of a strike or whatever it might be, um, and you are being sort of, you know, 
shoehorned into playing as a as a wing back. It doesn't really, to me, scream that the manager has an awful lot of confidence in you doing a job in in more serious games. So certainly one to keep an eye on, I think, for the future, just how he's going to react and what the situation is going to be. But in, in terms of tonight's performance, you know, I did think he was he was poor. You know, one one or two small moments of, of brightness aside. Um, but yeah, largely poor this evening, and it, that won't have done anything to have swayed uh, Tuchel that he is worth uh, more minutes in a, a more serious setting. Well, I'll go ahead and, and pivot to Ruben because you you crushed it there. Uh, it was great to see Ruben. He looked uh, fit. He looked sharp. His leg span, which is a new term I'm going to incre- you know invent over <laughs> wingspan, because at one point I, I don't even know who it was Villa. They like tried. They were back. They're back to him. They tried to go right. He stuck his right leg out. So then they turned and went to left, and he just stuck his other leg out without moving and completely had wrapped this guy up. Like, he had nowhere to go. Um, And his dribbles, uh, I felt like the way he was seeing the game, it was just very fluid for Ruben today. And the the problem is, I want to get excited, but... We've done this before, and like yeah, he looked burned before. Yeah, he's and he's looked poor in other games earlier this season, preseason, whatever it may be. And you're just like the gamble is what? Which Ruben are you gonna get right? And when we see Ruben today, we're like, oh shit, we're good, Ruben to the moon, like diamond hands. But then Tuchel's clearly seeing something different in training. Can, can I? Ju- I just want to jump in on that real quick. Uh, you're as welcome. You- delight me with the diamond hands into the moon. I think what is more impressive about this performance from Ruben in relation to maybe the last time we saw him play in a, a, a you know, in, in, you know, in rhythm for, for Chelsea kind of uh post injury is that he was able to do this while playing with a couple, as you kind of called them earlier, Brandon Busby's misfits, yes. uh, misfit players. Yep. Um, and I love them all against a Premier League side that was featuring a fair number of their Premier League players as well. Like Villa did not come into this match as a taking it lightly. I mean, I think they look at this more so as a winnable or a competition that they should try to advance in because they're not winning the Premier League this season. And so I think in that regard, Joe, I actually am more bullish. Like I'm buying more Ruben stock at the moment after this performance rather than I would be kind of like, bearish or kind of a little less optimistic about it yeah i, I think this is Five i'm probably going back Ruben. to Five. yeah yeah i think that that's going to be one of the the key features we see um i'm trying to think back to to fulham and you know his loan spell last season as well i think this is the first performance i've seen from him in a very long time including fulham as well where he has actually looked close to the player that was emerging under under Mauricio sorry um and it's in a much different position for him. Now, people will, will, you know, if you're an avid academy fan, people will know that Chelsea used to play an awful lot of 4-3-1 back in the day and and uh, Loftus-Cheek would be paired with Colkit or somebody else in terms of that midfield. Um, and when he first started playing for Chelsea and Mourinho, that pivot was where he was first introduced into the team. His first couple of performances were there. I feel that today we saw the first kind of version of this post-injury Ruben and where he does actually fit into a, a Thomas Tuchel system. The, the you know, the wide forwards, the number 10s, whatever you want to call them in this system, for me, play a little bit too back to goal. And I think that's never, ever really been Ruben's sort of, you know, sweet spot in terms of what he can do. And to Brandon's point now, bringing up the, the dribbles and the carries, I think now that you're playing deeper midfield, the way that we progress ball, particularly with the three at the back system, he can see the pitch better. He's got more space to drive into. You know, some of his, his sort of little abilities to... Uh, you know, kind of uh, move around people who are trying to press him is is very kind of Kovacic esque in that respect. The the ability to to wriggle, you know, from from a, a situation where he looks like he's going to get tackled and then carry the ball into midfield. But it was his passing and his uh, and his defensive work today that I think were outstanding in terms of things that we maybe haven't seen from him at this point in his career. So we're looking at you know personally today. I think he is now or should on uh, on merit take the the fourth central midfield kind of berth from Saul. Um, you know, Sal hopefully makes a, a comeback, you know, later in the, in the season when he gets up to speed with things. But I think after today's performance, you'd have to give that that central midfield uh, spot to, to Ruben. Um, but it's just such a different profile to what we have. And I think that's also the exciting part of it. Yes, he may not have the um, the sort of the, the ability to, to dictate the angles of build up and, and passing that somebody like Jorginho can or or has the, the experience and, uh, that Kovacic has. But 
the physicality, the ability to shield the ball, the ability to just brush people off, and then that explosion, that burst through midfield that we've seen, but picking a pass at the end of it, being dangerous, being threatening. Um, those are things that I think actually can add an awful lot to this team. And I'd be curious to see in a in a proper two cool kind of lineup with the, the full complement of players, what a midfield pairing of Kante and, and Loftus Cheek actually looks like. Because on paper, you've got a lot of physicality. Um, you know, Ruben, in terms of what he adds, is is kind of on the cover side of the spectrum. So, you know, you've got Kante and Jorginho, you've got Cover and, and Ruben, who are maybe more offensive in terms of their, their skill set. But looking at today, I felt he has he hit some wonderful passes, some great dribbling moments. But there was one, I think one particular tackle, and, and that was the thing that kind of said to me that, you know what, I think he might be getting back to somewhere that that is a Chelsea level. I can't remember, some, I think somebody lost possession and he chased back and, and, and hit a slide tackle. I think it was in the second half on, on one of the Villa players. And that's not something that I've seen from Ruben in a very, maybe since his his kind of Palace loan, even going back to sort of Sari time. So, you know, if this is a, a rebirth of a player and somebody who is going to maybe take advantage of the fact that we didn't go out and buy a Declan Rice or, or somebody and we've got somebody in on loan, um, Loftus Cheek's sort of rearrival into this squad. And I think he's sort of announced himself to Tuchel today that he is a a player that can be trusted against Premier League opposition, a player that can actually make a difference. And it was it was just such a, a great performance. And I, the one thing I'd say as well, just, just to, to round this off, at times, and actually probably the majority of games, he was playing as a lone number six. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't sort of that flat midfield check that we've seen. He didn't have... Um, a super amount of, of help, particularly in the second half. And yet the, the quality was still there. The defensive work was still there. And I think maybe the maturity to his game is coming there now. So he could be a sneaky option to feature more regularly. And I think, you know, this is the sort of game of performance that will give Tuchel, um, I wouldn't say problems, but certainly a nice positive headache because I've been super concerned that, you know, after Sal's kind of early showings that we still really have three usable midfielders and, you know, with people rotating, people being injured, wearing terror, et cetera. You know, we'd be lucky to get to Christmas on the schedule that we have. If Loftus Cheek can emerge and can actually deputise and, and maybe start adding a little bit different uh, profile and a different set of skills to the, what this Chelsea midfield traditionally shows, I think that can only be a positive. So I think he was fantastic today. Great performance. He was my dad of the match, getting the branding in there naturally. Um, but I think he was he was great. And I'm, I'm hoping that this is, you know, this is a springboard, a catalyst moment for him, not just uh, a four stall. And as you say, we've been hurt before. We've seen this before, but this is the first time I'd say post injury that I've really seen shades of the old Ruben and the player that we hopefully uh, thought he was going to be. Maybe this new position, this new lease of life, this new structure, maybe that's the way of getting him back to what could be a very, very top player for Chelsea. No other player would get this much patience from the fans. Uh, True. We've written off players far before him. Again, I just, I think the, the positioning today helped him to your point, not advanced having the play in front of him, letting him read and react versus having to be proactive. But again, we'll see. I would love to see more Loftus cheek this season. Uh, who scored game of 7.4, which is the, the, this, the highest score that Traore got for Villa. And he would have been our second highest, or he was our second highest time. Reese James, who got a 9.0, uh, Kepa got a 7.4. And Werner got a 7.2. Just that feels harsh for Keppa. Just to, just, just, yeah, look, goalkeepers are always gonna get under underappreciated on that comes to that stuff. So let's not be surprised. Well, of course you would say that, but, but I'm here backing it up. Let's talk about Keppa just briefly, right? I think my bigger thing, Dan, is yeah, he played well today, looked good. He talked shit to players. He was super imposing in the penalty shootout with playing the mind games and, and the mental warfare. But overall, um, you know, Tuchel's talked publicly and he's told Kepa to forget your price tag, just train, just be the best goalkeeper you can be. And this comes down to Tuchel, it seems like, because not a lot else has changed. Maybe we have some new goalkeeping coaches. Maybe Ilario's still there. It doesn't matter. Tuchel is the variable that has changed for Kepa. And it seems he seems to get be getting him into a spot that I don't think any of us 12 16, 18 months ago, thought could exist for Keppa. He's got a swagger back. I mean, look at the first few seconds of that penalty shootout where he <laughs> was uh, standing up, and he was, it was El Ghazi, right? Who, and just basically like giving him a stare, like, I'm oh, not yeah. going to move off this ball. I'm not going to move off until you, you put that spherical orb back on the dot, my friend. And had to be told by the official to go get on your line. Like, this is the, and actually, maybe that was the, the true shithouse moment of the match. She's like, he absolutely set a tone for how he was going to take care of the penalties. And I don't know 
if there's more confidence I've had in a long time and, you know, in, in, in a penalty shootout, I mean, we, we knew that Caballero had, did a good job at it, but this version of Keppa, this, this multiverse variant of Keppa is quite wonderful. And, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I think he is absolutely worthy of, uh, the praise. I think he's a, he's going to be our number two, but it's, it's a very solid number two to have. And I don't think there's much more else to say. Look, Dean Mears is ready to argue with you. He tweeted, thanks Mendy for stepping in, but Keppa's back now. Whew. Obviously, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to go that far. Obviously we <laughs> all know comment. Dean very cheeky, by the way, my favorite tactic, if I were Keppa, you pick up that ball off the spot from El Ghazi, you boot it in the stands, take your caution, then go back to your line. Oh, that would be great too. He he does have that swag moment about him now though, Joe. I think he's he's refound, rediscovered rather the confidence that he was lacking, and I'm glad that this version of Keppa can exist in our lives. Two things: that story that Brandon told sounded suspiciously like something that he has done previously. And I'd be very keen to see a buzz being kind of shoot that moment. Hey, you need any edge <laughs> you can get. You go get the ball, especially in high school. There's no ball, boys. <laughs> you have to go get it. <laughs> Okay, so we're uh, we're getting a nice insight into Busby as a goalkeeper. I quite like that. And the second thing, yeah, I mean the the, the confidence thing is is crazy. Um, and I mean I'm not I'm not super fantastic at analysing goalkeepers, but the penalty save itself was looked absolutely fantastic. Super, it was actually a really well struck penalty. Lots of power behind it, well placed, um, but such an amazing save. And I think the, the weird thing I was saying now, certainly if we're looking at the sort of transition he's gone through. I kind of felt confident going into penalty shootout with Kepa in goal. I felt, oh, he's definitely going to save one or two. And that is something that I felt about penalties for Chelsea for a very long time. Um, so to see, yeah, to see the confidence coming back, to see him again have his moment, make the save. Um, and just, yeah, the mind games, the approach he had, the, the constant talking to the penalty taker. Um, I think I really, really enjoyed that. So, yeah, it's great to see him back. But I don't know if I go as far as, uh, as Dean is saying that Mendy's now the... Uh, number two but uh, you know stranger things have happened again tongue in cheek from from dean that's his classic shtick on twitter uh i love it uh lastly if we want to talk about more questions and answers again i think we kind of touched on sar i think joe gave his verdict on sewell my thing is i want to put out there uh i love you discord all right i do all right but we got to halftime and all of you tinkermans out there were like chop and change you wanted ziesh off you wanted sell you wanted all these players off my kind of point, and I'm coming at this from like a coach and a player development standpoint. And I think <laughs> Shane, no, seriously, I think Shane will have Papa this, Busby will have the same the same perspective of me, and that as a player, you need minutes, even when it's not going well. Soccer is a game of chess. Football is a game of chess in the sense of if you're going up against a player 30, 60, 90 minutes, you're going to be trying a lot of different things. It's not always going to work. But for every minute you're on the pitch, you're a minute smarter versus someone coming in. They have to start the process all over and adapt. Malang Sar needed time on the pitch to figure out his first touch and where it's going. All right. Um, Ziesh needed to just work some stuff out and at least feel trusted that he was out there until he got sub, which I think is fine. Timo got a full 90. That's good for his confidence. Got another... Uh, got a goal, even a, a you know a headed goal. Calum Hudson Odoi played ninety. Ruben played ninety. Treble played ninety. Again, I I think I understand where like you guys are ready to chop and change. My point though here tweets was that it was a Carabao Cup. We rotated to get guys minutes, and for us to give new guys minutes that didn't get a lot this season, and then just yank them off halftime because that's not good enough. That hurts them more than it helps them. We need as fans need to be patient to let them go out there, struggle through 45 minutes, see what they do in the second half, and hopefully get some things figured out. But these guys need minutes. When is the next time we're going to see Malang Sar? I probably Southampton <laughs> in the League Cup, honestly. You know, and so my perspective is these guys needed 60, 75, 90 minutes to struggle to get their game legs back, get some fitness. Uh, react in real time that they haven't had to do yet this season. So uh, that that was my perspective of everyone hoping for uh, massive overhauls at halftime. The Malang Sar thing, the question itself, I mean, the next time we see him, it, it probably should be for the under-23s. I mean, he he had... I don't even really know what he was doing in the first half. I mean, there's... there's you know, maybe he was trying to be like a, a Rudiger clone with the aggression, but Rudiger has 
managed to channel that and actually use that in correct situations. There was a, a moment where he bundled over Traore and then seemed to sort of kick him 15 times as he rolled through him and then stood up. It was it was a bizarre performance from him in general. And again, you know, when you're talking about the, the deputy as a left-sided centre-back, whether he features again for, for Chelsea's first team will be, will be interesting. Um, and the other thing about the rotation stuff there, Brandon as well, you know, we we are going to play, you know, 60-odd games this season. The Carabao Cup, I would imagine, is probably the lowest priority for the club this season in terms of, you know, you know we want to win the Club World Cup. We've already won the, the Super Cup. We want to win the Premier League this season. We want to have a go at winning the Champions League again um, and probably, again, have a good go at winning the FA Cup. When you can take the chance to rest, you know, Jorginho, Kovacic, Aspilicueta, Thiago Silva, Andreas Christensen, you know, these players are going to be playing so many minutes this season. Every opportunity that you can rest them for 90 minutes, you have to try and take that. And as much as, you know, people want to, to see different players playing, or as you say, make massive wholesale changes at half time or earlier because things aren't working out, sometimes you have to look at the bigger picture and actually resting some of these first team players, the sort of de facto starters, is is probably worth it in the in the long run versus, you know, having a bench full of, of you know, the the guys who played against Spurs and have, have played an awful amount of football already. But just to put it into context, you know, I think it might have been after the Liverpool game. What was that second, third game, third or fourth game or whatever it was in the season. You know, Jorginho came out after the game and said he was physically shattered after 85 minutes. We've got another 50-odd games to play this season, an actual starting, you know, holding player in, in, in the Tuchel system. So every opportunity you get to rest him and other players, you have to take it. And if that upsets people and if people are, irritated by the the lack of, of of rotation or throwing on more starters or throwing on some of the better players then I think Tuchel got the the, the perfect balance and, and called the you know the the selection right tonight you've got to rest guys you've got to also give your squad players minutes you've got to keep them involved you've got to keep them engaged uh you know look at Kepa the turnaround's been incredible in terms of his engagement uh young players getting minutes etc so I, I don't see anything wrong with it and anybody who was was complaining. I think you know when they take a step back and look at the bigger picture of minutes for minutes for squad players, minutes for fringe players, plus resting uh, your kind of core starters. It's the right thing to do, and I don't think there's any debate about that. Yep, cosine. That, that was uh, the the complete and finished article in terms of an explanation. Doesn't need anything more. I was hoping you're going to say something silly, Dan. I was ready. I was ready. <laughs> the pre workout is kicking in. The bane fuel. <sighs> All right. Um, anything else you guys want to touch on? Timo scored. Obviously, that's a that's a net positive. We do for the need team. to give a little praise to great Timo. Goal. Like Timo finding the back of the net. The the goal was great. I actually think the delivery might be better than the goal. <laughs> um, but seeing Timo Werner get rewarded with a goal and then having a unfortunate <laughs> shot uh just moments after it. Um I mean, it's a story of, unfortunately, Timo, but him finding the back of the net, hopefully, as we, we all kind of has said before, finds the right amount of confidence for him that he can uh, be counted upon to do that more frequently than he did uh, than last season. I mean, that, that would just be the best possible thing. I have a, a question, and it's a bit of a... It might be a, a bit of a tricky question, but from that sort of inside right channel, who has a better delivery, Reese or Cesar? Well, I mean, Ooh. Cesar has a bigger body of evidence to prove that for now. So, um, but it's not like it's not in Reese's locker. So you're going with Aspilicueta? I think just based on he's got the numbers to back it up for now. I think Reese might have the power on it. Um, I mean, he d- he does spam, I think, a little more when he gets the opportunity. I think Aspi is a little more selective. I, I would well, from a wing back to- position, to be fair, he's deeper when he hits his crosses. He was in the Aspi spot today. He was standing in the home of Aspi Laqueta today, right? And so when he and that's why Aspi loves that. There's a pocket of space where the defenders have been drawn deep, and he can just he put his foot on the ball, picked up his head. And put it right on Timo's forehead. Um, literally, cop and carby yeah. of applied of directly to the forehead. Yeah, I bet. Like, if we could clip <laughs> two together, it would be mirror images, Joe. Mirror images. Yeah, it was. It was kind of spooky to see the the delivery, the angle. Um, I think the one thing I'd say, I agree with Brandon. I think Aspilicueta has shown from that area over his career that that is something that you might even dub it the Aspilicueta channel when it comes to crossing. I think Reese might be technically better in terms of the actual striking of the ball aspect, the whip and sort of the dip that you get from them as well. But uh, yeah, it's it's really, really interesting to see certainly both guys who obviously started out careers as natural fullbacks 
stepping into that right towards, uh, right center back spot that that let's call it the Aspilicueta zone um and then delivering a, a very similar uh, quality of, of cross that we saw and I would yeah if, if anyone who does uh, or makes videos would be very interested to see the side by side between that and the was it the Zenit goal that Lukaku scored recently I can't remember there was a yeah, cross the, yeah the header. Yeah, they had it. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to see them side by side just to see how they actually look. Should we, should we also like before we we go on to the outro pieces, talk about how how much of an earful Thomas Tuchel was giving the fourth official in this match? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Like, did it ever stop? I mean, there were a couple moments where I did see him sitting down, but I'm sure he was still shouting out a couple things. But the man was dropping. Dropping a masterclass, like he was dropping a dissertation to the fourth official for the <laughs> the terrible officiating. Hey, Tuchel cares, all right? He's not going to give an inch, even if it's the Carabao Cup. And I love that passion for him. Um, and honestly, the referee was out of his depth. Um, he was struggling. Was I actually felt kind of bad for him just because, y- you know, when the players react that way, they know that he doesn't really know what's going on. And you know, I bet him refereeing without VAR in his back pocket, you know, made things more difficult. But a lot of, you know, he definitely was not ready to make a call of tweets. He was, he, anytime he could, he waved it off and just was like, no, 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 uh, I'm not making a call. And that pissed off the players because he wasn't able to to control the match. Yeah, I mean, I know that there is this directive this season for, I think, referees to try and let the game Mm-hmm. flow a bit more which i, yep, I have yep, absolutely yep. no problems with that um and even i can even sort of put up with inconsistencies from different referees from match to match what i, I don't really understand though is within the game itself you were having moments where villa would foul a chelsea player wave play on and then literally the next kind of contact in the game would be a carbon copy of what just happened but then there would be a free kick like actual individual like inconsistencies during games and referees where, you know, if you're going to call something and it's weak and it's cheap, fair enough, but then you call it for every player in every circumstance, you don't kind of pick and choose or, or duck out on decisions. And that's what I think players get frustrated because, you know, if you set your baseline, okay, this is going to be a foul, this is not a foul, and then you keep that throughout the whole game, even if you think it's a bit of a weak call, for example, you know how the referee is going to play, you can adjust your, your you know, the way that you're playing, your aggression levels, et cetera. Um, but the the inconsistency during this game in particular, I just found a bit baffling. As you say, you know, you're getting shoulder to shoulder kind of challenges where somebody's quite clearly a bit stronger. The the Buendia thing was was a bit of a farce as well. Um, but there were de- definitely moments where I certainly felt there were there were fouls made on Chelsea players, particularly Lukaku when he came on. It was like a you know the what was it hacker shack? It was just yeah you know the, that yep. tactic of just fouling him at every opportunity, and because he's big and physical, nothing gets called on him. So that was that was frustrating and. Yeah, I, I definitely, I was actually, it was actually quite amusing to see Tuchel's uh, little kind of indignant face, like a child who's just been scolded um, when he was forced to sit back down in the in the dugout. But I love the fact that he is so, um, so behind his players. And actually, it's what you want. Referees, you know, if they're having a poor performance, they need to feel pressure occasionally to adjust what they're doing and start performing in a manner that, that befits the level of football that they are, you know, actually interacting with. So, um, yeah, strange game. Referee definitely didn't help us in in any sense of the word there. But it's uh, I think it's it's becoming a little bit of a running theme. I know Brandon has mentioned uh, referees to me previously, and I certainly noticed the the last guy's name who I've completely forgotten his name now. Tierney. Premier League. Tier, yeah, Tierney. Yeah, I got a WhatsApp from Brandon during that game about his refereeing, and I was like, yeah, it's absolutely spot on. But you know, you you kind of forget how much of an influence a referee can have on the game. It can be free flowing. It can be bitty. Um, but as I say, all you want is consistency. And I don't think we saw that today. All right. Let's hit the Dan of the match. A lot of caps, Dan. I it's it's a little hard to read. Are you yelling? It was it was a yell. I mean, there was enthusiasm. There was excitement. We had just won on a penalty shootout. Even, even though it was the Carabao Cup. Like it it had the energy. It had it had, you know, it was oozing kind of just so much positivity. And yeah, I, I went with a little wrestling theme, a little oh yeah. And uh, I gave you Stone Cold Keppa, Reese the Rock James, Triple H Chalaba, Macho Loftus Cheek. And uh, I think the people responded. The people like this one. And uh, 37% of people thought Stone Cold Keppa walked away with it. But this is a, cl- this is a close one. 32% went with Macho Loftus Cheek. And then Reese James, 28% as well. Triple H Chalaba, unfortunately, only 4%. But... Look, when they were as good as Keppa and Loftus Cheek, it's really hard to uh, start splitting the hairs there. 
All right. Well, uh, the immediately after the game, uh, the next round uh, draw happened. We've got Southampton at home. Uh, I like how you walked by all the wrestling stuff in there. Brandon Busby just walked past it. No, no acknowledgement. So we said something about <laughs> Tino Livermento and Alonzo Darby. Is, is that right, Joe? Yeah, that's uh, that's going to be interesting. Um, if if Alonzo's first choice stint continues and, and maybe um, maybe he starts this game, I think Tino Livermento will fancy his chances quite a bit if they're both playing in, in that match there. So yeah, the, the Livermento Darby or revenge game whatever you want to sort of, uh, you want to call it there. Um, definitely not a derby, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the, oh, I don't know. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be fascinating just to see him play at Stamford Bridge in the, in the sort of, uh, you know, a Premier League team such uh, you know, League Cup game, but I'm, I'm excited to see him. Um, but I'm not particularly looking forward to his pace and directness up against Marcus center forward Alonso. So uh, we'll see how that goes this season. So some of the results uh, from this round, Stoke City beating Watford three to one. So Premier League team out uh, Leeds sneaking by Fulham um, Liverpool crush Norwich. Really no surprise there. Um, Southampton, they advance on penalties. They were two, two against Sheffield. Uh, Brentford winning seven, nothing at Oldham. I saw a funny tweet saying the fact that Brentford are a big team and not on the receiving end of this in the Carabao cup just shows you how well they've done. Uh, Everton losing to QPR two, two in regulation loss eight, seven on pens. Uh, that is not how they want their season to be going. Uh, West Ham beating Manchester United. And apparently the fans have all decided they're selling Anthony Martial. So it could be a cut rate option for anyone interested. Uh, Wolves somehow messing it up and uh, beating and losing to Tottenham. Uh, I'm not really sure how that that happened because I believe they got a late goal to go up 2-1. Uh, then obviously Chelsea beating Villa. So uh, Dan, run us through the fixtures for the next round of just some of the top teams so we can get out of here. Yeah, Chelsea versus Southampton, Arsenal versus Leeds, Stoke versus Brentford. Big one right so there. Brentford probably advances. Uh, West Ham versus Man City. That is a tasty fixture that neither side probably wanted in round four Leicester versus Brighton which I actually would think that Brighton on current form might get something out of that Burnley versus Tottenham QPR versus Sunderland <laughs> which is like neither of those could go to a Premier League side okay that's fine and then Preston North End versus Liverpool Rigged. so uh look City did not get an easy draw which is probably the most confounding thing in this because this has been their tournament to get the easiest advancement every year for the past couple seasons so that alone makes me feel better about this draw even though liverpool and brentford and uh you're gonna advance probably pretty easily same for tottenham all right well as joe tweeds once put it in whatsapp very winnable is how he views this so uh joe thanks for jumping on as always really appreciate the insight and the passion that you bring to the pod yeah, it's been uh, it's been a good one, guys. I quite like these uh, sort of immediate post match ones. It's a nice little uh, chance just to to riff on what we've seen rather than go into uh, enormous detail, which is also a nice thing to do as well. Well, let's. It's a little goofier. It's a little more relaxed. It's a little bit more cash, which I know is driving Brandon Busby absolutely up a wall right nope. now. But that's okay. I was down. I was up for it. I just need uh, Joe to clear your your diary on Saturdays and Sundays post match then because. Might have signed yourself up for some more work. But anyways, that's going to wrap us up. <laughs> Again, we'll have the Manchester City preview coming at you before that one this weekend. Um, but Chelsea, moving on in another tournament. It's Tuchel time. It's what we do. Um, wasn't easy, but it was a great experience, I think, for the players out there on the pitch, getting it done. And by the way, we finished with an absolute rocket from Reese. I mean, come on. We didn't even talk about his celebration and the confidence that he oozed. I think the entire home crowd now caught Reese's confidence because it was so electric. Uh, but anyways, I'm super excited. You should be as well. Uh, Manchester City, big one. If we go over this hump, title favorites. I mean, you can't say otherwise. So anyways, that's going to wrap us up. Until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do? Keep the blue flag flying high.